Thanksgiving, 1821, the Reverend Edward Hitchcock starts his lesson out of the Creation Psalm 104. O Lord, how manifold are thy works. In wisdom thou hast made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. This great and wide sea wherein are things creeping, innumerable, both small and great beasts. There go the ships. There goes the Leviathan, whom thou hast made to play with. In that first marvelous Thanksgiving sermon by Hitchcock in 1821, he expressed wonder at the beauties of the shapes of the created beings in the ocean. And among the beauties were the sawfish, such as this great snout that would be attached to another eight or 10 feet of fish. Fish were making a huge impact in the 1820s and 30s and 40s in paleontological literature. The most famous influential paleontologist was Louis Agassiz, the fish guy. And the most successful fossil fish finder was Hugh Miller, Scotsman, newspaper um, editor, and a fierce defender of the independence of the Scottish Presbyterians. And the one scientist that Hitchcock wanted to meet above all when he finally did visit Europe in 1850 was this Scotsman, Hugh Miller. And Hugh Miller said, and he wrote in the Testimony of the Rocks, his greatest book, that the fossil fish show that creation unfolded in stages and that the great fish come before the great reptiles that came before the great mammoths. But the very first fish in the first wave were God's grandest fish productions. It was like a parade of mounted knights, and in the parade you would put the best, the brightest, the strongest knights and the fiercest stallions in the front row, just so the earliest fossil fish were the best of all. Interesting metaphor. It's totally wrong and misleading, but it's an interesting metaphor. The Reverend Edward Hitchcock, I would argue, the best mind in dinosaurology ever, Reverend Hitchcock was a creationist. The great Scottish fossil collector, Hugh Miller was a creationist. The great fossil fish thinker, uh, Louis Agassiz was a creationist, but they weren't simple, know-nothing creationists. They had a theory from fossils, from anatomy, that creation came in successive levels, and in each level, every species in every part of its anatomy was perfectly adapted for that time, for that place. The tropics beckoned these minds. Here's a wonderful cabinet full of tropical shells, many from the Sunda shelf in the South Pacific. Snails, clams, oysters, scallops that thrived in tropical waters. These spoke to paleontologists because if you dug fossil clams and snails from the Jurassic of England, they just screamed, tropics, tropics, warm, warm. If you dug fossil plants from the Jurassic of England or from the Jurassic of Massachusetts or Connecticut, those plants said, we're tropical. So it was a known fact, it was established that the past was warmer, much warmer than now, that in the Jurassic period, tropical conditions existed. And according to the theory, the nuanced theory of creationism, in the tropics, you can't have humans. In the tropics, you can't have intelligent forms of life. You couldn't have the brainiest, smartest, fastest animals. The tropics were a time of sluggishness and slow life. Alligators, crocodiles, they're fine in the tropics. That theory even extended to human civilizations. The savants, the thinkers all over Europe and North America, including Hitchcock, believe that the highest flowering of human civilization couldn't be in the tropics. It was here with the temperate zone. As life moved to the next layer of creation, the summers got a little less hot and the winters got a little colder and you got the great mammals of the Cenozoic um, era. You had the saber-toothed cats and bears and mammoths and mastodons and finally people because the world was finally ready for people. So 
These are creationists. They're thinking creationists. They're trying to put all of the history of rocks and fossil plants and snails and clams and dinosaurs into this history of preparing the Earth's surface for the flower of creation, us. <laughs>